Hello, 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 everyone. We are back. My name is Amy D. McKnight, for those of you who don't know me, and we are still in Module 1, The Basics. Lesson 3, Creative Warping Methods. This is the Epically Creative Rigid Heddle Weaving Course, Module 1, Lesson 3. And in this lesson, you will learn principles of creative warping, the warping process, warping methods, how to wind on without help, how to thread, secure, and spread your warp. Go ahead and give this video a thumbs up. Um, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And let's get into it. So we're going to be looking at principles of creative rigid heddle warping. All right, as I mentioned before, go ahead and warp in black. You want to warp more than you usually would. So we're going to be experimenting. We're going to be playing. We're going to be um, just like having fun. And so for a little while, I just want you to suspend uh, what I want you to suspend. I want you to suspend the need to have to have a perfect outcome because I'm giving you permission to play, right? Like, um, I'm just telling you that you can play. You can have some fun. What can we do with this fabric when it's done? Well, it's fabric and we can make things. And in future videos on this channel, I'll be giving you some ideas of some things that you can make from this creatively woven fabric. But for now, just have some fun. It's okay. Nothing bad will happen. We're going to warp for weft face or weft emphasis weaving. As we've talked about in the last video, if you haven't watched that already, go ahead and stop this video now. Watch the last video and then come back to this video so it'll make a little bit more sense. Continuing on in principles of creative rigid hill weaving warping. I'm just going to be going through the process of what you're going to do. Notice to the left, I got this thing. I want to encourage you. You got this. You've got this. You can do it. It's not that hard. And once you master warping, everything is downhill because, again, as yarn worker likes to say, you have to be warped to weave. And once you get warped, once you get con you get confident at warping your loom, you're golden. You can do it. So we're going to do this, and we're going to do it over and over and over again. And you're going to get good at this. All right, so you're going to measure the length and the width. You're going to slay the slots, roll the warp onto the back beam, thread the heddle holes, attach the warp to the front of the loom. That's it. Now I'm going to show you this in practice. So in this video, we're going to be looking at three different methods of warping. We're going to be looking at direct warping board hybrid warping. So we're going to direct warp the loom using a warping board, which is the hybrid method of warping. We're going to be looking at a hybrid method of warping your loom off, warping the heddle off the loom. And then we're just going to be talking about <clears throat> double threading warping. All of these methods are going to be useful for different things that we're going to be learning about in modules to come. So they all have their purpose and they are all useful in helping you to be able to think differently, to have choices um, in the decision making as to how you can, the word that's coming to my mind is attack, probably not the best word, but um, how you can approach, approach a project that you're going to be doing. All right, so we're going to start out by looking at the direct warping board hybrid method. So. And then we're going to look at warping heddles off the loom. And then we're going to look at double thread warping. All right, let's start out with direct warping on a Becca. And I figured I'd do this on the Becca since there's not a ton of information out there about warping the Becca loom. But y'all should know that before all these other looms, there was the Becca. Actually, I think Shaq was around the same time. But anyway, um, this was the loom of choice for a lot of people and this is a really cool loom i'm going to actually do a video going through the looms that i personally have and what i love about them all i'm not even going to do cons i'm going to do what i love about them because you can figure out your own cons but um i like my beccas i have three of them i've had many of them in the past i've taught a lot of uh, classes using them i like my beccas if you want to buy a becca DM me because I actually am a um, distributor for Becca and hey, that's another way to help me and help support this channel. So I can totally, um, 
I can sell you a Becca. It's going to be the same price as with Becca, but it really helps me out if you want to get one. So anyway, that was a tangent. Let's get into the rest of this. The direct warping board hybrid warping method. This is the standard method of warping a rigid head loom with a twist. So instead of using a warping peg, I'm going to be using a warping board. And I'm going to be demonstrating this, as I said before, on the Becca. What you're going to do, you're going to place the loom on the flat edge of a table across from the warping board. You want to, as you can see in the picture, you want to kind of make sure that that little back block is kind of, <laughs> it's kind of wedged up against the table. So you want to use the table with a straight edge. You're going to secure the loom and the warping boards to the table. I am using I think these are called C clamps. They're kind of like C clamp clamps on steroids. I kind of took them from my husband's shop. So anywho, yeah. All right, you're gonna secure the loom to the table, the warping board as well to the table. So you want both of them to be secured and ready to go. All right, so now we're gonna do this math. I'm gonna repeat this and then I'm, we're gonna see this slide a lot. I'm probably gonna skip it <laughs> because we're gonna repeat this ad nauseum, but this is how you de determine the desired width of your cloth. So when you figure out how wide you want your cloth, you're going to add about 10% to the width for draw in and shrinkage. You're going to get used to, as you weave more, knowing for which types of threads you're going to need to add more, for which types of threads you're not going to have to add as much, but 10% is a good place to start. You're going to mark the width on the heddles using some waste yarn, as you can see in the picture here. And you're going to remember to center the cloth in the heddle. You want to have that cloth centered in your heddle. And you're going to place the heddle on the warping blocks against the shed block if you're using a Becca. So I'm just going to, I'm going to do and telling you again, marking the width in the heddle with waste yarn. Place the heddle on the warping blocks against the shed block. So for my Becca people out there, um, um, you're you're not forgotten. Yes, we're gonna come through the rest of y'all. I got some things for you too, but for the Becca people, these are some things to help you use your looms and appreciate what you have. You got something good. You got hidden a gem right there. You don't have to be um, feel happy. Yes, the Becca is not the underdog. Anyway, place those shed blocks against the place the heddle blocks against the shed blocks, and um, and yeah, that's pretty much what you're going to do, and that will help your your heddle to stay in place as you're warping. All right, now, how are we gonna figure out how long we want our cloth to, to be? We're going to do this by adding about 12 inches for loom waist, plus or minus, this will depend on how you secure your warp to your back beam and your front beam. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, but you're gonna add about 12 inches for loom waist. And then you're gonna add another 20 inches for take up, which is, I'm not even going to try to do that right now, but pretty much is how when the when the threads are intersecting with each other, interlacing with each other, they're going to kind of they're going to draw in a little bit. So you're going to add about 20% for take up. You're going to create a guide string of that desired length, and you're going to tie the guide string to a tooth if you're using a Becca to the back beam or to the back apron rod, depending on what type of loom you're using, and you're going to create a path for the warp to follow. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm pretty much telling you again, repetition deepens the impression. Create the guide string, tie it on to a tooth on the back beam. You're gonna create a path for that warp to follow. And then you're gonna start at the first slot that you tied on the yarn, if you're using apron rod or the back beam on a Becca, and you're gonna thread the yarn through the first slot, follow the guide string path down and back and repeat across. So we're gonna start at the first mark. For a Becca, I would say it's a good idea to kind of mark the distance on those teeth as you did on the heddle so that you'll know where you're going. <laughs> it may not be perfect and I'll explain why in a minute. You're gonna thread the yarn through the slot, you're gonna follow the guide string down and back, and you're gonna repeat across. Warning, all right? 
from my Becca's people. On a Becca, the teeth will not match up with the slots on the 12 dent or the 8 dent reed. If you have the 10 dent reed, which comes with a Becca, you'll be fine. So you may need to double back and keep the, to keep the width of the warp within the marked sections on the back beam. This is the other reason why you want to mark it on the back beam of your Becca, just so that it doesn't get super weird and wonky as you're trying to work that on. No worries. It will be fine. Now, I had to double back when I got to the end, like I was telling you, because I was using a 12 dent heddle, and so it's no big deal. We're going to fix all this. It will all be fixed in the winding on. All right. So, if you're using fine threads, it's okay to double back. If this would bother you, the next method is an alternative that will work with all heddle dent sizes, and um, that is this this is this is we're going to secure the warp with ties so every yard 18 inches when starting we're going to keep the warp threads from becoming tangled and we're going to chain our hand crochet to the first tie in front of the heddle all right let me let me skip that i'm going to be showing you a method in the next method that's going to um take into consideration for those becca users who have an 8 or 12 dent heddle and that is what's going to be coming up in the next method but we're going to continue on <laughs> in the process of warping what you're going to do so after you've gotten your loom um you warp the width you have your 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 warp on your warping board this is what you're going to do next you're going to tie secure the warp with ties we do this so that our our, our warp stays at the right tension and that it doesn't get wild and wonky and go haywire because those strings want to do their own thing. So you want to just go ahead and tie it every 18 inches or every yard. Um, it all depends. You know, when you're starting out, you might want to tie it more. Um, as you get more comfortable, you may want to make the spacing between where you tie the ties. And what I'm talking about are these ties a little wider. Um, it's not that it's no big deal. All right, this keeps the threads from becoming ta tangled. And then we're going to chain or hand crochet to the first tie in front of the heddle. So I'm showing you again what I'm doing. I'm tying it off every 18 inches. I'm going to be chaining, hand crocheting to the first tie in the front of the heddle. All right, so that was the Becca. Next up, we've got our Ashford Samplet 10, and we're going to be warping the heddle off the loom. All right, so this method is most useful when the warping board of your loom is a part of the bottom of your loom. Think your Ashfords and your Kromskys. So if you have a loom where the warping board is on the bottom of the loom, then this method will be helpful for you so that you can do the direct warp and use that 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 board that's on the bottom of your loom. Um, yeah, this will help you. It's also helpful when warping multiple heddles on any loom for multi-shaft weaving. And we're going to cover that in Module 5. If you haven't already, subscribe so that you'll know when I put that module out. It will be in the coming weeks. And again, it's useful if you have a Becca loom, the method of tying it onto the back beam. So, you're going to place your warping board or your loom turned upside down on a table and secure. You're going to place the warping peg directly across from the warping board and secure. All right, um, really quick. In this picture, I just want to see, want you to see how the warping board is set up. For most warping boards, you're going to have a single peg that's on the short side. I don't know how all warping boards are done, but you're going to have like a single peg that's like, um, that's, that you can use as like a middle or whatever so that you can you can use that as the one that you want to have your warping peg directly across from all right so that's the one so that would be equivalent to having the warping peg directly across the room <laughs> from the warping peg when you're trying to do, do your long warps using like um your hallway or something like that there are so many problems with that, and I will talk about that in another video. Let me not get sidetracked. All right, we're going to do the math again. I'm not going to go through it again. I'm just going to let you pause this video, look at this slide, and um, write it down. It's the same. All right? Now, the only different things that we're going to do is we're going to place the heddle 
between the warping board and the warping peg and we're going to hold them up hold it up with clamps so right here you see i've got the heddle and i'm holding it up with with like um little clamps they have a name and i can't remember them right now but it's okay you know what they're you know what they are they're like little clamps they're like big clothespins right all right again we're going to determine the desired length of the cloth i'm not going to read this slide again just pause the video and take notes we're going to keep going all right so we're going to slay the slots and we're going to do the same thing this is the same process we're going to start at the first mark we're going to go across and just keep going and then we're going to tie we're going to secure the warp with ties and we're doing the same thing. Now, the only thing that's different is that when we are doing this warp off of the, with the heddle off of the loom, you wanna leave about 12 to 18 inches behind the heddle nearest to the warping peg. You wanna leave that free because we're gonna need that, that extra yardage behind the heddle for when we tie the warp onto the back beam so that we can roll on, okay? We're going to chain and hand crochet to the first tie in front of the heddle. And we're going to move the heddle and the warp to a table or a comfortable spot to thread the holes. All right. Two down. One to go. Double thread warping. This is pretty straightforward. So this method is helpful when working with um, class warp. We're going to cover that in module three. Thin threads. Um, mixed color warp. We're also going to color that in module three. Um, color weave, color and weave. Again, that's going to be in module three. Module three is a really fun module. That's actually module three B. Um, and it is the fourth module in this series. Yes. So it's module three, but it's three B. Okay. You'll see it in a, in a couple of weeks. It'll be out. And it's also useful for warping for multi shaft weaving. Um, there are there are different ways to warp for multi shaft weaving, but when you're starting out, using this method will help it to make a lot more sense. And when we get to module five, um, a few weeks from now, this will all make sense, and I will refer back to this 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 video um, so that you'll know exactly what to do. All right, so we're we're gonna do pretty much the same thing that we've been doing. <laughs> We're going to place the warping board and the loom on a table to secure it. Um, we're going to we're going to do the math. Pause this video, save this this to watch, to look at the slide if you need to. We're going to determine the length, the same that we've done before. And now, this is where it gets a little bit different. We're going to slay the slots and the holes. So we're going to start at the first mark and we're going to tie on, you know, just like we normally do. We're going to thread it through the first slot or hole, you know, if you're going full width. And then we're going to go and follow the guide path like we've been doing. And then we're going to thread the yarn through the next hole or slot. So we're just going to be threading completely across. We're going to follow the guide path down, repeat across. So you see in the picture that the slots and the holes are all threaded across. And then of course we're going to secure the warp with ties like we've been doing before and we're going to chain um you know and hand crochet now i did a really short warp for this one so you know you don't have to always hand crochet um if it's not super long just make sure you tie it really good but um if you know that you're going to be going away from your work for a little while you may just gonna go ahead and do that if you have cats kids dogs anybody <laughs> so your warp doesn't get messed up all right we're gonna remove the warp though we're gonna move, remove from the warping board um like i said you can chain it or just let it rest i was about to wind this on right at that moment and so i was i did not actually chain this one and you're gonna wind it onto the back beam this is super straightforward there's nothing else to do this is actually a really fun way to do it because once you get every once you get it slay you're just winding it on it's, it's like super easy because you've slayed the slots and holes just ready to go winding on without help i know that this is something that is super um, important to a lot of people this is actually your key to freedom in your rigid huddle weaving um because yeah 
<laughs> as I, I was about to say this. So this is your ticket to leaving freedom. No, not needing to depend on someone else to help you allows you to create on your timetable. You don't have to be, um, you don't have to wait for someone else to do this for you. You can just do it yourself. And this is, this, this, this will free you. Yes, it's, it's so worth learning how to do. So I'm going to give you the written text. And I have a series of videos where I'm going to be showing you how to um, dress a Ashford, the Becca, and the Shacked. And these are going to be pretty much like silent videos. You're going to turn on some music or you can watch them silently. But for the sake of YouTube, I'm not taking out my videos and putting any music in there. So I'm warning you in advance. But you're going to be able to look over my shoulder and watch me warp those three looms from start to finish and see how I wind on. And hopefully this will help you to see how you can do it too. All right. So. Pretty much, you're gonna chain your warp. This is important. You want to have your warp chained. You don't want you to have. You don't want to have a mess unless your warp is really short. You want to have separators ready. You can use paper, cardstock, placemats. I've recently come to start using blinds. They're kind of fun. Um, but whatever you your your normal warp separator, you want to have that ready. You want to clamp down your loom, and then you want to check it twice to make sure it's really clamped down and secure. Now. I don't have pictures of the rest of this part because I'm actually doing it. And so I do have a video of me doing this. So I'm, um, I don't have pictures for this, but you're going to sit or stand in front of your loom and begin turning the back beam to start winding on the warp. Depending on the type of loom, you may have to move around more or less. You may have to manually t turn the beam with your hands for the Becca, for the Ashfords um, and the Crickets. I think you can use the the, the Ashford definitely, and the Cricut, you can use a little handle to turn your warp and sit in front of your loom, depending on how big your loom is. You're going to add warp separators. You're going to wind a full rotation. You're going to stop and pull the warp firmly. You're going to add more paper and warp separators, and you're going to be generous. They're, warp separators are cheap. Paper is cheap. Blinds are relatively cheap, actually. After you purchase them, you can reuse them over and over again. Thread's going to cost a little bit more than all of that. So be generous. Like, there, like <laughs> there is no, you don't win a contest if you use the least amount of warp separators. Like, be super generous. Um, yeah, there's, you win when you're generous. I say this because sometimes I look and I see people. Oh, and other thing is use it wide. Don't be cheap, right? Like I, I know <laughs> use it super wide. In fact, sometimes it's better to warp not the full width of your loom so that the, the threads aren't going all the way across because you don't want your warp to fall off the edge of your warp separators because that causes problems. So if you're having problems, um, try warping the loom generously with warp separators and warping it in a space so that the warp is confined and there's a good little bit of warp separator on either side so that your warp isn't falling off the edge of the separators that causes problems all right pull shake strum but don't go with your fingers because that can cause tension issues you're gonna you're gonna pull it you're gonna shake it you can strum it. You're going to see me doing all these different things in the coming in the videos that are going to be coming after this one. <clears throat> but don't comb it with your fingers. It's tempting. When you get it most of the way on, I guess you can sometimes. I, I, I succumb at the end of my warp. But generally, don't, 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 don't comb. Because you're going to have areas in your warp that are uneven. All right, threading methods. You can thread the slots, wind on, and then the holes. You can double thread the slots and the holes or you could thread the heddle off the loom. All right, so slots, wind on, then hold. That's generally how we most, most of us learn how to do it. You thread the slots, you wind it onto the back, and then you thread the holes. So this is the method that we're all familiar with. Once the loom is direct warp, you just wind on and transfer one thread from the slot to the adjacent hole. Double threading the slots and holes. In this warping method, the, thread, in the threading of both the slots and the holes, you're done as you're pretty much doing it all at one time so it's it's kind of kind of cool threading the heddle off the loom <clears throat> so this is for those of you who have um that are going to be using different things we're going to talk about in future modules or um for those of you who have the warping board on the bottom of your loom um as opposed to um using a separate warping board with your loom so we're going to thread the heddle off the loom 
and you're, it's pretty much as it said. That's why we left a good bit at the at the back, nearest to the warping peg, um, behind the heddle, so that we'll be able to do this without having any problems. So I'm going to explain it as it's the most unusual of the three methods. For those who are used to indirect warping, it's going to be pretty familiar of what you're doing. So at a comfortable table, you're going to cut the, cut the warping peg a loop. You're going to thread the holes, moving one thread from each slot over to a hole. You're going to tie the warp ends into bunches or loops every inch or so. And when the threading is complete, you're going to bring the threaded heddle to the loom. Right, so the loom, as you can see in the picture, this is the back beam of the loom, and so the back is facing me. So the warp chain is up here. That's the front of the loom. This is the heddle. This is the back of the loom. Right. All right. So we're going to now. So now we're we're coming back around to the front. You want to secure the warp. Now I've already lashed it on, but I, I didn't take a picture of this part of the process. But this is important. You want to secure the warp to the front beam because you need a bit of tension to pull. I, I'm pretty sure you're gonna see me do this in the video, but you're gonna secure the, the warp to the front beam so you can have some tension to pull against when you're threading on. You don't need a whole lot of tension, but you just want to make sure that it's secured. You can tie it, you can stick it down the front apron rod and crank it a little ways to give it, to secure it in there, but you wanna secure it to the front beam. You're gonna lash on the back apron rod in preparation to wind on. So you're just gonna lash it on I, you're going to see this in the process as I am in the coming video. And then um, you're just going to tension it, and that's it. So, securing the warp to the front. Y'all want to know what the right way to tie on is? I know y'all been waiting for me to tell you. What is the right way to tie your warp to the front of your loom? It's the way that works best for you. All right. So if you found a method of securing your warp to the front beam that gives you even tension across your warp, use it. There is no one right method for doing it. I like lashing on. It's my go-to method. But if you get tension, if you get good tension tying on, don't change. Do that. And I feel like this is important to say because sometimes people are like, oh no, you know, she looks like she's doing it so easy because she's doing it this way. I have, I think I can say hundreds now um, between my own personal weaving and preparing looms for classes. I have warped my loom hundreds of times and the method that I use is lashing on. So if you're a brand new weaver and you're watching me dress a loom, understand that I have warped my loom hundreds of times because I weave almost every single day. Don't compare my middle. I'm at my middle, I'm not at my end yet. I got a lot of ways to go. Don't compare my middle to your beginning. Don't compare anybody else's middle to your beginning. You'll get there. But if you found something that works for you, do that and, and be happy, all right? All right, securing to the front. There's some different methods of doing this. So there's lashing on, there's tying on. There may be some other way, but <laughs> I don't know what it is yet, but lashing on and tying are the two main ways of securing your, your warp to the front of the loom. You can also use a clip, but I'm not gonna talk about that right now because it's not very common. But yeah, there are three ways, but I didn't cover the third way because it's not all that common. Another video, I'll do that. All right, lashing on. You're basically gonna tie the warp ends into one inch bundles. You're gonna to try to make sure that the knots are about the same distance from the front apron rod. You may have to trim it. I didn't in this picture, but you can trim it to make it make them a little bit more even. You're gonna measure, um, and you wanna use a strong, smooth thread that's about five times the width of your warp, and then you're going to double it. You're gonna secure the loop around your front apron rod. If you're using a Becca, you're gonna secure it around the, a tooth. <laughs> And then you're gonna pass the lashing thread through the shed space between the threads of the first knotted group. You can use your fingers or put it in an up shed or whatever so that you can see, um, you can see, kind of pull the threads up so you can see where that space is. So you can pass the thread through. And then you're gonna pass it around the front apron rod or through the teeth and up and around the next bundle. I'm gonna show you this. So you don't, if this isn't making sense, if the, the directions aren't clear, that's okay. I'm going to show you the process in a video to come. 
You want to try to keep even tension as you're lashing on. When you, each th when you reach the end, secure the lashing yarn using a couple of slip knots, and then you're going to go back and pull to remove the slack. You're going to start the first bundle, you're going to pull the slack out, you're going to hold that slack and move to the next group and pull slack, pull slack and hold, pull and hold, pull and hold, all the way across. And then you're going to untie the end and, and to remove the slack and then retie. And you're going to adjust as needed. The tied areas um, can be turned to adjust the tension, depending on what type of loom you're, loom you're using. <laughs> okay, tying on. All right, so you're going to start from the middle, um, and you're going to tie the thread to the apron rod in one-inch bundles using a surgeon's knot. You're going to work back and forth from side to side, and it can be helpful to advance the warp on a click each time you tie a new knot. So it, it that is super helpful. Um, I think I remember hearing Sign Mitchell on a podcast somewhere at some time. I don't know which one. I don't know when it was. But she mentioned that there's somehow that if you um, are tying, if you're doing the tie on method and you tie a knot and you turn a click before you tie the next one, it ha actually helps to make sure that when you're not when you're finished tying all the knots back and forth you don't have slack once you try it you'll know what i'm talking about and it's it's really really helpful all right spreading your warp you want to use something that's easy to take out car stock strip works well if you have an if you're an ashford owner you those came with your loom you can always cut some more um bulky yarn can also work you want to use a bulky yarn that um you probably are going to take this out before you wash it, um, but in case you want to wash it, you don't want to use, like if you're using wool, don't use a bulky wool to um, spread your warp because it's going to probably get tangled. Just saying. All right. You want to weave three picks and then beat. That's one way you can, you can weave three picks and then beat. That's another way to spread your warp. So these are all different ways to spread your warp and I'll be demonstrating them. Um, and you're going to repeat that until the warp is evenly spread. All right, y'all. Wow. This was long. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in here with me. So in this lesson, you learn the principles of creative warping. Um, I shared with you the warping process, um, warping methods, how to wind on without help, how to thread, secure, and spread your warp. All right. For those of you who are following along with me, I want you to take action now. Follow along with me as I prepare to dress my looms for weaving. I'm going to be showing you demonstrations of how to dress all of my looms that I'm going to be using during this, um, this series, these, this multiple series of videos. And in the next lesson, I'm going to be showing you how to load your shuttles, how to secure the beginnings of your weaving. So... If you haven't already, go ahead and get that game board. It's You can download it. You can print it out. Um, it is in the link description below. Fill it out as you go. It's a good way to chart your progress. If you're not in my community, which I'm about to tell you about in a minute, hashtag Creative Weaving Basics. When you take a picture of your of your game board, and um, and yeah, so that so that we can do this do this together. However, if you want to go through this together with other people who are doing this, then Join my weaving community. Um, it's at www.myweavingcommunity.com. There are monthly membership levels. It is a month-to-month -month subscription. You can join at whatever level um, fits your budget, fits your desired level of participation. Um, but yeah, it's a really cool way to interact with others who are going through this process together. It's a really cool way to be able to um, interact with me on a, on a more personal level. You can actually post pictures and show me what you're doing. You can ask questions and it's really fun. We have a really great group of people who are in the community. Hey, thank you so much for wa watching. If you haven't already, give me a thumbs up, all right? Give me a thumbs up. Leave me a comment. Let me know something that you learned. Subscribe. Why aren't you subscribed? If you are subscribed, you're hurting my feelings. I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry real tears. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to cry. Um, I, I do would love for you to subscribe. Ring that notification bell so that you'll know when I put up my next videos. Actually, the videos I'm going to be putting up after this video are the videos of me dressing the loom and you're looking over my shoulder. So you can actually like, um, in most places you can't hang out as yet, but um, 
you can hang out with me in my weaving studio and watch over my shoulders as I dress my loom. So ring that notification bell so you know when I upload those videos. And share this video. There's somebody who would be super, super happy to catch a nugget of some of this information I've just shared. And um, yes, share the video. It, it helps me, um, helps the channel. And I really appreciate you taking the time to watch. And y'all, I will see you in the next video where I will be dressing some looms next videos. And I'll see you in the next lesson. Bye.